<laughs> All right. Um, any questions about the project? Uh, I have fallen behind grading. I aim to get caught up by end of this week, I hope. Knock on wood. Yeah, I was going to say, you, students are, are some, and, and maybe that's part of the reason I'm sympathetic to students that fall a little behind and need to catch up, because I do it periodically. I was doing so good for a while that I had a couple of tough weeks and, and it slipped. But anyhow, we're not going to talk about my problems today. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about, um, our, our topic, the topic that we're going to talk about is forms. Uh, forms in HTML, and, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, but I want to sort of set the stage for what this discussion is, is about, because the bigger issue is uh, talking about, um, how do I want to put this, how certain websites work. Certain websites do some things that, at this point, if this is all that you've had, if this is all the web development classes that you had, it might be confusing how certain sites work the way they do. Let's put it that way. For example, Google. If you go to Google, and type something in, We notice that you can type anything in Google and get search results. All right. Thinking about what we know about HTML to this point, there's nothing that we've seen in HTML to this point that would sort of make this possible, right? I mean, we haven't covered every little thing in HTML, but we've covered a good portion of HTML. And there's nothing that we've seen so far that seems to account for this kind of behavior, right? Being able to put something in and, and get results. Like, you might, you know, you, you, you might think for a second, although I think you would, you would quickly decide that this isn't the case, but you might think for a second that Google has all these web pages sitting out there waiting for us. And as we type them in, uh, we get the page that's already been prepared. That doesn't really make sense. I mean, think of all the things that you've ever Googled, and then think of everyone that you know and all the things they've ever Googled, and so on. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. They'd have to have an army of programmers sitting there making web pages 24-7 to accommodate that. So that doesn't really make sense. There can't be pre-written HTML pages sitting out there waiting. Plus, it, the, the plot even thickens. Is if you notice, when I Googled Italian restaurants, amazingly enough, the Italian restaurants that it shows are ones that are close by here. All right? Uh, Olive Garden, Sorrentos, Angelinas, and so on. Now, does that, are, are we led to believe that these are the top Italian restaurants worldwide? Probably not. There's probably some in Italy that are better, all right? There's probably some in, in, you know, in New York, uh, in Little Italy, in Cleveland maybe, you know. There's, there, these are clearly probably not the best, but somehow it knew, somehow Google knew um, that these are appropriate search results for us because chances are if we want to go get a bite to eat, we don't want to travel to, to Italy to get something to eat. I mean, that'd be great, right? But it's not something that everyone could do at least too often in their lifetimes. So it gives us search results around where we are. So if you were in New York City, you would likely get things around you. And if you were in San Francisco, you get things around you and so on and so forth. So if you think about it, um, it even gets worse than just having a web page for every possible thing that you could search for. Because now it has everything that you could search. Now it's, it's giving us results based on what we've searched for, along with where we're located. Now, it even, if, if you do some more examinations, it even, it even gets worse than that. For example, if I were to Google software, 
it would likely, it would more likely give me software that runs on Windows and runs on a Mac. All right? So if you think about it, these pages are some degree customized. All right? They look the same. So if someone were to Google in New York City, the shell of the page would look the same. There'd probably be a map with the most common ones listed up here, and then results, and then some pictures, and so on. So the shell of the page would look the same, but the details would look very different. We can come up with other examples of this. All right. If you were to go to eBay, for example, and let's look for something. Let's look for a laptop. All right. There's a rating. There is a picture of it, um, the rating, the feedback of the person that's selling it. Um, and so on. I was looking for one that isn't buy it now. Um, that might be hard. All right, starting bid zero dollars. If I were uh, if I were to go in and were to bid forty one dollars and hit place bid, and then you were let's say on your computer and you looked up this, it would no longer the page wouldn't look like this. It would it would instead of saying zero dollars as the the highest bid, it would say forty one dollars. All right. So again, the page um, changes over time. Now again. They don't have an army of programmers there. Oh, what, what, wait, there was a bid on that laptop? Let's go in and change the HTML for that. Not at all. So clearly something else is going on here that we can't explain by plain old HTML. All right? And I'm going to use an analogy. I, I always use, I, I use a lot of food and uh, analogies and, and, and examples, and I apologize for that. Um, but let's think of, going to get a sandwich for lunch, all right? Let's say we want to go get a sandwich for lunch. And we go to McDonald's, all right? Which I wouldn't, wouldn't do, but someone might, all right? I don't really like McDonald's. So you go to McDonald's and you order a Big Mac and fries. Now, what does the person behind the counter do? Typically, they turn around. They grab a Big Mac, especially during the lunch rush. They're going to have a lot of these waiting in the bins, all right? They're going to turn around, they're going to grab a Big Mac and grab your fries and hand it to you. That's all they do. No special preparation goes. All right? Um, someone comes in and orders a quarter pounder, turn around, grab the quarter pounder, and whatever. All right? Compare that to Subway. If you go and get a sandwich at Subway, all right, at every step of the way you have choices, right? Um, you can get... Uh, you know, if you got, let's say, a turkey club sandwich. Well, we could both get turkey club sandwiches, but they could be very different, right? Because you might get yours on wheat bread, and I might get mine on Italian bread. And you might get Swiss cheese, and I might get provolone cheese. And you may not want yours toasted. I don't know why you wouldn't want yours toasted, but you may not want yours toasted. And I, of course, I'm going to get mine toasted. And then you might want different vegetables on it, different toppings, and all that. Now, if you think about it, do they have Millions of sandwiches sitting back there in the bins waiting for someone to come in. Oh, wait a minute. That person ordered a turkey on wheat with mayonnaise and pickles. Let's see. OK, here. Here it is. No. They make it for you on the fly. They make it for you right there in front of you. All right? And then they give it to you. Because it wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't be practical to have all these sandwiches waiting for you, just waiting for someone to come in and order. Uh, because again, if you think, you know, if you did the mathematics on how many, how many permutations there would be or combinations there would be for just even a simple one sandwich, there would literally be millions when you included like 
Well, one with green peppers, one without green peppers. One with mayonnaise, one without mayonnaise, and so on. So it would be impractical, if not impossible, to have that. So they don't try. What they do is they have a recipe in their mind. They know what goes on a turkey club. They know the recipe. They know the process for making a turkey club sandwich. And then they get input from you about the exact details of it, like what kind of bread, toasted or not toasted, what kind of cheese, and so on down the line. All right? Those two scenarios are a lot like the difference between what are called static web pages and dynamic web pages. Static web pages are what we have done so far in this class. Now, when I'm talking about static, um, I'm not talking about static like if you rub a balloon on your hair, it will stick on the ceiling. All right, that's a different kind of static. What does static mean when it's used this way? Consistent. Consistent. That's a good way to say it. Anyone have another way to define it? Say something static, it means it's unchanging. So if you were to go and open up the first web page you did for this class, it would look exactly like it did the day that you turned it in. All right? It would look no different. It would look exactly the same. All right? So it's unchanging. And when we talk about web changing, or when we talk about web pages, yeah, you can change a static page, but it requires a manual change. In other words, someone would have to go and edit the HTML. All right. And there's some websites that contain static pages. All right. Simple websites typically would contain static pages. Something that was sort of, uh, you know, like maybe for a, a small mom and pop restaurant. You go, it might have like a picture of what the front of the restaurant looks like, the hours, um, what their menu looks like, uh, phone numbers to call. If they do catering, there might be a separate page about that, and, and so on. A static website might be good for a situation like that because their information doesn't change very often, right? Usually a restaurant gets their hours defined and they keep it for years. You know, it's rare that they would change their hours. You know, maybe, you know, maybe once in a great while they would. And their menu, they might change it maybe a couple times a year, but it's not like something that they're going to change like every day, all right? So for a small website, like for a small restaurant, a static website might be fine, composed of just HTML that doesn't change, that stays constant, and people request the pages and they get them. But for larger sites, and really if you think of any of the, the, the big names in the internet, uh, sites that you probably visit, uh, that you might visit on a daily basis, or at least frequently, um, Google, Facebook, eBay, Canvas, all right? All these sites, there's something else is up, right? Let's even think about Canvas. I go in to log into Canvas. And I give my username and password. Notice I give my credentials. I type them in on a form, all right? And I hit return, and I get a list of my classes. You do the exact same thing, and your page is going to look kind of like mine, but it's going to look different. You may not have six emails, all right? Um, you're not going to have these classes necessarily. You're going to have some of the class, you know, you're going to have CISS 216, but you're not going to have the other classes unless you happen to be in those other classes. Um, you'll, you will have the other classes that you're taking, all right? What's more, um, if I go into this class, I can do stuff that you can't. So I can click on assignments, and I can make a new assignment. You can't make a new assignment, all right? 
Not that any of you would if, if you could, all right? Oh, let's see, I think we, have a, we need a couple more homework assignments. So you probably wouldn't do that, right? So not only are the courses different, but my capabilities within the course are different. And yet, we're visiting the same website, and if we looked at the URL, the address, we likely might be visiting the same URL. Yet it knows something about us, and it customizes the page for us. How does it customize the page? Well, based on those credentials that we typed in when we logged on onto the form. All right? These are dynamic web pages. And in dynamic web pages, the web server, remember, the web server is where the web pages live, but the web server doesn't have completed web pages. It has programs that create web pages. All right? So when you do dynamic pages, you're not just writing HTML, you're writing programs to write HTML. So languages such as PHP or um, Python or ASP.NET and C Sharp or Java or any number of different languages you can write these in, but they all work the same. They are, think of them as recipes. They're instructions for the computer on how to prepare the web pages. Now, let's go back to the sandwich example. The server at Subway has a recipe uh, of how to make a turkey club and gets information from the user about certain parameters about it, like what kind of bread and so on and so forth. At the end of the process, whether you go to McDonald's or Subway, guess what? You end up with a sandwich. All right, they hand you a sandwich. Because a recipe doesn't do you any good. You can't eat a recipe, right? The best recipe in the world doesn't mean anything until someone goes and processes that recipe and makes the sandwich or whatever, all right? This is how server-side scripting works. Server-side scripting are programs that create web pages, that create HTML documents. What kind of HTML documents? Like all, like the HTML documents we've created in this class. The only difference is, instead of you writing the code, you write a program that will create the code. And guess what? When you do that, you can customize the page for a certain user, for a certain location of the country, for a certain platform, so Mac versus uh, Windows, or iOS versus Android, uh, and any number of different factors. You can even do searches. Uh, Google, for example, considers 30-ish factors, I don't know, something like that, including your search history and including like what it got, gathers about you from Gmail, all right, and things such as that. It's interesting because like, um, you know, it's interesting when you search for something that um, um, could go different ways in the search. For example, Don Cherry is a great jazz musician, all right. And Don Cherry is also the name of a hockey commentator in Canada who wore these like really crazy like jackets, you know, real, real typical sports announcer type, you know, but up in Canada. If Google detects that you've done a lot of searches about jazz musicians, they're going to return you information about Don Cherry, the trumpet player, if you search for Don Cherry. If you've done a lot of searches on sports, Google's going to return Don Cherry um, the, uh, the sports commentator if you do a search on Don Cherry. So they can customize the page to meet your parameters. Let's draw a diagram, and I, I probably have drawn this diagram before in class. Um, if you have me in other classes, you'll see this a million times, I guarantee it. We have a client. And what, is the, what do I mean by client? I mean this person that's sitting and browsing the web. So is someone sitting at a desktop machine or a laptop or a mobile device or anyone that is using the web? They make requests through the internet. And we have a news alert. Sorry about that. Um, someone I know had an had a instructor that every time someone's phone went off in class, they had a quiz. Yeah. 
just uh, as a motivating factor. Now, I don't know what, what, what they would have done if their phone went off. Like, would they give, like, extra credit points or what? But I don't have that policy, so no one gets points or has points taken away from my phone going off. All right. Okay. Client is connected to the Internet. They make a request. What is a request? A request is typing in a URL in the address bar. So if you typed in www.google.com and boom, that would be a request. All right? Or if you clicked on a link on a web page, that would be making a request. So that information goes through the Internet. We don't care. It's drawn as a cloud because we don't care exactly the path it takes. All right? If you're in a networking class, maybe you care about the path that it takes. But in our class, we don't care about the path that it takes. And it ends up at the appropriate web server where the web pages live. Now, in the case of a static web page, the request is simply the URL. That is the address of the web page. Either you click a link or you type in the URL. The URL is the address of the page. It makes it to the appropriate server. The server finds that page and returns it to you. So you make a request, the server responds, and they give you an HTML page. And by HTML page, I mean it contains HTML, CSS, JavaScript, the related images, and so on. All those things get delivered to your web browser. All right? This is in the case of a static page. This is like the server at McDonald's. All they do is they find the thing that you asked for, and they give it to you. So you order a Big Mac, boom, here's your Big Mac. All right? Go on your way. Yes? What's the difference between Java and JavaScript? Good question. Uh, JavaScript is uh, used within HTML documents. All right? Uh, JavaScript is a, you know how there's like, and again, I apologize if, if no one's a drinker in this class, but you know how you have beer and you have light beer? All right? <laughs> JavaScript sort of like Java Lite. All right, is sort of a scaled down version of JavaScript for a specific purpose. And the specific purpose is to make your web pages interactive. All right? Whereas Java, full Java, is a full blown programming language that you can do anything under the sun in. All right? um, JavaScript is, is used for specifically some purposes within a web page. OK, so that's a basic static HTML. Now when we talk about dynamic pages, you have these things that are called scripts or programs or whatever. And they have to be executed by the web server. In other words, when the server gives you a Big Mac, they don't do any processing to the Big Mac. They just take the Big Mac and give it to you. That's like a static page. A dynamic page, some work has to be done. There isn't a page out there ready for you. The page has to be made right then on the fly. There are instructions on how to make that page, but those instructions have to be executed by someone. Just like there's instructions to make a turkey club, but those have to be executed by someone in order for you to have your turkey club. All right? Now, the web server reads these instructions and then interacts with other things, like maybe a database. All right? So, for example, we both log on to Canvas. All right? There's a database somewhere that says, First of all, what our username and password is to make sure that we've supplied the right credentials. All right. It then looks to see what courses we're taking. It then looks to see what role we, we are in those courses. For example, I could be taking a course here in which I'd be a student. And I wouldn't be able to grade stuff in the class in which I'm a student. I'd only be able to grade stuff 
in the class in which I was an instructor. So it takes the information from the database, and per the instructions, it creates a web page just for that situation. It custom creates one on the fly. Now, here's the thing. Regardless of what path it happens, what gets delivered to the client is the same, an HTML document. All right? So the server may, in the case of a static page, simply grab a finished HTML page and deliver it to the client, or the server might do some execution of code, might do some processing, and accessing a database, and so on, and then come up and develop an HTML page. And then that page gets delivered. Now, in the case of a dynamic page, the request, there's more than just the address that's relevant. Anytime you make a request, there's a whole bunch of things that go over with the request. It's just for a static page, really the only thing that's relevant is the URL. In the case of a dynamic page, you send over any data that you entered in in a form. Like, for example, in Canvas, your user ID and password. When you go to that page, you send that data to the server. All right? And that's part of the request. Your IP address, I guess that's also relevant for static, but in the case of dynamic pages, they can use your IP address and get an approximate idea of where you're located. They can at least get an idea of where your internet service provider is located. All right? And chances are your internet service provider is close to where you, you are. All right? So in other words, LC's internet service provider knows that we're somewhere in the Illyria area. It might not know exactly where we're located, but it knows we're in Illyria. So when we do a Google search, it gives us uh, results relevant to that area. There's also information about our platform. In other words, are we on Windows, Mac, Android, iOS, etc., And then a bunch of other things as well. All right. All these things come over as part of the request. And all these things are considered or can be considered by the web server in creating your HTML page. So it can take into account information that you supplied on a form. It can take into account your geographical location. It can take into account the time of day. Right? If we went to a TV network's website, we went to HBO's website, would see the TV shows that are on today, right, if, it, if we looked at their schedule. And if we searched later on, um, it, it would show us, like, instead of what's on during the day, it would show us what's on in the evening, right? And what's more, it would be smart enough to know that we're in Eastern Standard Time, so it would show us the times in Eastern Standard Time instead of West Coast Time, and so on and so forth. Questions about this process? What are the languages that we use here? These are just plain old HTML, CSS, JavaScript. These are the things we've been doing all along. These pages are written in ASP.NET plus C Sharp, or Java, or PHP, or Python, or whatever. There's a whole bunch of different tools that you can use to create dynamic web pages. But they all have the same thing in common. They all work the same way. They all are instructions on how to make a web page and not a web page itself. They all get processed on the web server, and the end result is a web page that gets delivered to the client. Now, you might ask, well, why did we spend nearly a semester talking about HTML if to do anything really cool, we have to use server-side scripting. Well, keep in mind, when you write server-side scripting, you're writing programs that create HTML. Well, you can't write a program to do something if you don't know how to do it yourself, right? So if you don't know like, what HTML is and how it works, you can't possibly write a script to write the HTML, all right? 
So we learn HTML because, first of all, parts of dynamic pages uh, are unchanging. So not every piece of a dynamic site is, is uh, changes per user. For example, if we look on Canvas, things like this. The home page, you know, the links that are here. Those are the same regardless who logs on, right? Those links. Or if we go to, to Amazon and search for something. A Chewbacca seatbelt shoulder cover. Yeah, right, right. Uh, stuff on here on the top of the page, that doesn't change for every user. That doesn't change for every product, all right? Stuff over here changes for every product. Ooh, look, you can zoom in. Nice. Yeah. And the general format is the same, but these links at the very bottom of the page, those aren't any different for each person. This section, these sections are different. These sections are not. So even a dynamic page has parts that are static. So it is worth your time to learn HTML, all right? Um, because first of all, you will be right, you will still be writing HTML because even dynamic pages have certain sections that are static and don't change. Secondly, you need to know how to write HTML yourself before you could write server-side scripts to write the HTML. So either way, you need to know HTML. So don't consider this um, like, well, we're going to learn something else to replace this. No, we're going to learn something else to augment this, not to replace it. You got to learn how to crawl before you can walk, right? Uh, it's like anything. Anyone that's done, that's done computer programming, if you're calculating like the speed of someone taking a trip from here to Chicago, you know, if you travel X miles and it took y hours what was your average speed well you got you can't write a program to do that if you can't do that yourself right so therefore you need to know how to do something before you can write a program to do it all right the piece that we're concerned about is the uh, for this class is the forms piece in html we're going to study how we create in html documents that allow the user to put information in and send it to the web server. All right, that's the piece that we're concerned about. We don't cover this in this class. We don't cover this piece of it in this class. We just cover creating the form data here that the user types in and then sends it to the server. And then once we send it to the server, that's someone else's problem. OK, there are classes where we do talk about server-side scripting. CISS 243, CISS 2.32 uh, talks about uh, web servers and, and writing dynamic pages. OK, I think I have an example prepared. It's a rainy Monday, and if I have one prepared, that will be great. All right, here we go. All right, now, we are going to use someone else's server-side script to do this. We're going to use the Bing search engine, all right? Um, because we want to show, we want to make sure that we've created the form correctly. And really, if we do the first part, 
of creating the form. We can't tell if we've done it correctly until we try to attach it to a server-side script. So we're borrowing Microsoft Search Engine. And don't, you know, this isn't us doing something that we're not allowed to do. They encourage you to do this and so on. So it's not as though, you know, this is anything shady where we're, you know, hacking their machine or anything. We're just, we're just using their script. But we created the front end for it. All right? So if I type in a search for something, HTML, and hit go, all right? There we've just done a Bing search, all right? Yes? How would you write in the code for that form to incorporate that search next to Bing? Well, that's exactly what we're going to look at now, all right? So let's look at that. All right, real simple. We have a form tag. And we have two attributes to the form tag. All right? We have the action and we have the method. All right? Action and method. Your question of how we incorporate that with Bing is, the script, or the, the, the form, will send its data to the URL that is listed in the action. All right? So the script that Bing uses to do a search, the URL for it is www.bing.com slash search. Now, how do I know that? I know that because I did just a tiny piece of, of reverse engineering. Let's go to bing.com, and let's do a search. So I search for HTML. All right. How do I know the URL for it? Well, the URL for it is up here. The URL is everything before the question mark. Well, that's not true. The URL is, is everything. But the, UR, the part of the URL that's going to be our action is the part before the question mark. All right? www.bing.com slash search. So that's how I know what the action is. Now, one of two things. If you're doing a, an application, if you're doing a website, Either you're the person that's writing the client and the server code, so you know, you know you're the one that made that up. So that's how you know it. Or someone will give that to you if you're not the one that's doing that. All right? So I think in our lab assignment, I say, this is, what you, this is the, the, the page that you go to to submit the script. All right? And, um, you know, so I gave it to you. But in other cases, you're the same person that's writing the client and the server side. So you will know, you know, you'll know because you're the one that made up the name of that script. But in this case, all I did is some reverse engineering. And the script that I want to call starts off whoops, everything before the question mark. Everything after the question mark is called the query string. All right? And notice something on the query string. What do we search for in that example when we went to Bing? We search for HTML. Notice Q equals HTML. All right? Let's do another search. Q equals C, uh, uh, we did a search for CSS. URL is the same, so we're going to the same page. The query string starts off the same, but then instead of Q equals HTML, Q equals CSS. Everything on the query string fits a certain pattern. It's the name of a, of a field, an equal sign, and then a value for the field. 
And each field represents something, represents a piece of information that we're giving to the server. All right? And so in our case, the field name Q is, guess what? The question that we're asking the server, what we are searching for. So the Bing search engines is, is expecting the URL to be bing.com slash search, and it's expecting everything that we're, whatever we're searching for to have the name of Q on the query string. Q equals something. So when I make my web page, I give my action of that URL. I give a method of get. Get simply means that I'm going to use the query string to send the data. There's two ways to send the data. You can send it on the query string, or you can send it sort of hidden from the query string. When we're first learning this, um, I prefer to send it on the query string, because then you can see up on the query string, yeah, we sent that data to it. If you're doing something like sending a password, though, you might want not want to put it on the query string, because then it could be seen by someone or intercepted. Notice this, though. Input type equals text, name equals Q. Hmm. Name equals Q, that corresponds to the name that Bing is expecting. It's expecting the thing that we're searching for to say Q equals something. So therefore, when I make my page, I'm going to give the text box that I'm entering data into the name of Q. Pardon me? Well, the Q is going to be whatever I type in that text box. So in the, the second case, when I do a search for CSS, it's going to have CSS. If I type HTML in there, it's going to say HTML. If I typed in Cleveland Browns, it's going to say Cleveland Browns. All right? So that's the name of the field that we're sending to the server. And as long as we match that up, then the script will take it. The script doesn't really care that it came from us instead of from Bing's front page. right? It just has a request, and it's going to satisfy that request. The last thing we have is we have a submit button. And the submit button is actually finalizes it and says, OK, now go to the server. Because keep in mind, we could have a bunch of fields that we enter in. Think of a form when you register for a website. right? You have your first name, your last name, your address, your city, state, zip, your phone number, your email address, your mom's maiden name. You have all this stuff that you got to enter in, right? So there might be a whole bunch of fields that you enter in that you fill in. And when you're all done filling them in, then you say, OK, I want to go process this data. And you click a Submit button. So that's what a Submit button says. It says, take that information and send it to the server. Now in this case, Sending it to the server just consists of sending that one field, Q. So let's look again at my page. All right, here's my page. And I type in Cleveland Browns and click Go. Here's the URL that I sent the data to. All right, that part's the same. Where did that come from? Came from the action of the form. So the action of the form is the URL that my data is going to get sent to. This has a name of Q. So whatever I have typed into that text box is going to put get put on the query string given a name of Q. So that's how we connect this there. And the, the submit button simply says, OK, now and go and actually call that URL, do the search, and display the results. Now, this is probably like the simplest form that you can create, right? Because all it has is a text box to put one thing in and a submit button. Right? 
And a text box is good for searches, right? Because you don't know what you might search for. You know, that's a free form field that any user can type in. All right? There's other form controls, though, that limit you to making certain options. Um, if there was a yes or no question, for example, you wouldn't want to have the person to type in yes or no, right? Because someone might type why, someone might type yes, someone might type you betcha, whatever. All right. So therefore, there's other form controls you can use when there's a limited number of selections, like a drop down or a radio button. And we'll look at those next class. The main thing I want you to get for this, first of all, is understand the process of a dynamic web page. And then in this case, understand the basic tags that we talked about. The form tag with the two properties, the action and the method, the text box, input type equals text, name equals Q, how that action and name of this text box is used together to send the, the, the data to the web server to be processed. Okay, we'll see you up in lab. Well, three HTML pages, and you more than likely will just have one CSS file. Okay. All right, one CSS file that all of them share. All right. All right.